Well, uh, welcome everyone, and thanks for making fun to join us. I think you might be able to give all of you something to take away. Our uh, goal cool today is to talk about a new collaborative. It's just we don't even have a term or an acronym yet, but uh, among the LGBTQ groups in this region. And when I say new, I mean that we first met at the end of July. So, but I think, you know, and, and, and Thomas was part of that initial piece and also as kind of an observer, but we have achieved some nice things in a couple months. So this panel will be one of two. So come on in, that's fine. We got lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, not surprising, it's a little bit of a maze. We're gonna, you know, blame them close for us. <laughs> So, um, Jamie, want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Jamie Trachtenberg. That's why we will see you on here. This is just what you did. Um, and I am the outreach director for the Pittsburgh Lesbian and Gay Film Society, um, also known as Real Q. We put on the um, annual LGBT Film Festival every October. It's actually coming up next Friday. Um, and uh, it's a completely volunteer organization, so everybody on our board is a volunteer with a full-time job. So um, I uh, basically juggle doing this, which um, this time this time of season it's really a full-time job, matched with the full-time job that I have during the day. Um, but so it's 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 a, it's a it's a hard it's hard, but it's you know it's rewarding. And I'm Sue Kerr. I blog at Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence, pgslesbian.com. And um, I'm a social worker by training, a social media addict by happenstance. Um, and right now, I'm working with the Gay Lesbian Community Center of Pittsburgh. And I think we have a title for that. Social media manager, which sounds very well paid, doesn't it? And, um, <laughs> the, you know, as one of our goals with the community center, we're, we're sort of the hub of the community, the center of the wheel. So this is something we wanted to try to do, is to kind of get everybody together who was using social media, see what we were doing and figuring out how we could help each other and work together. So we're going to kind of take you through that process today. And um, you know, if you have any questions, you go ahead and don't shout them out, raise your hand. And, uh, but uh, you know, we'll be happy to answer questions. I want to start off by saying, we've talked about this in a lot of JB says LGBT, I say LGBTQ. It's cool whatever you want to say, assuming it's decent. Uh, we're not going to get caught up in the alphabet soup thing. We will talk about that later in the presentation as, as an issue that comes up when you're trying to collaborate. But just know that we know that people describe our community using different terms, and the important thing for our purposes here is to just be respectful. It's okay, you know, have, however you want to phrase your question. Please don't let that hold you back at all. And I also just want to explain why there's a difference. Because we don't work with the same organizations, our organizations have different. And there's a lot of letters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, do you want to talk about the film festival? Sure. Um, so we have been um, in existence since our 28th year. Um, we're actually the fifth oldest LGBT film festival in the, in the country. Um, sixth in the world, um, so that's a pretty big feat for Pittsburgh. Um, a lot of people think we're not as progressive as some other cities, but that's a pretty long time to have a festival going. Um, and uh, basically, we just um, we have a group of people who get together, we watch films, and um, we choose the ones that we think are the best, and we bring them to the theater here. Um, we have a lot of great films coming up this um, this next week. It's, it runs. Um, October 11th, um, which is next Friday to the 19th, the following Saturday. All of our films are at the Harris Theater downtown, um, so it's you know it's pretty uh, um, easy to get to. Um, I do have um, some we call these mini schedules. They've got a list of the films, information about tickets and things like that. Um, or if you'd like, this is one of our these are our full programs that we give out at the theater. If you want to peruse through one, um, it gives you a little bit more information um, of who we have as sponsors and um, community co-producers. And actually, Sue and Thomas are both sponsoring films for us this year. Um, so that's really, that's really great to have um, 
you know, that collaborated as well. And I told him the title of my name's talking is called Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they picked that to me, but I was just, when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite a funny movie, yeah. too. Um, yeah, Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf? And, and the woman dresses up like a giant vagina. There's a photo of it, but you don't like to see it. I don't know if you have to Really? Oh, like I said, I just thought we should put that in contract. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we have those there. I've got some um, magnets as well with the dates to remember and my card if you guys have questions. Um, we're always looking for volunteers during the festival. A volunteer gets your free t-shirt and a free movie ticket. So um, it's always a bonus as well. So. so the Gay and Lesbian Community Center um, got its start in the mid-1970s for SAD Center and some mental health organization that was founded in 1972. And what they did is they started this phone line, information and referral phone line, and it kind of just bounced around. It was in people's houses, it was in someone's office and everything, and you know, and eventually that gave um, the footing for the community center itself to start its own organization. So it didn't really spin off of Persad, but Persad was part of the, the foundation. And in 1981, it was incorporated. It's been in several locations around the city, but currently it is on Grant Street in the 200 block, and um, which has just been, I think, five years now they've been down there, and that's been a, a really big change. The organization is all volunteer and operates on the shoestring budget, so we can definitely appreciate those of you who also do the same. Um, we have a, a the third largest LGBT library in the nation, called the Jim Fisher Keller Library. We are known for the services that we provide to you. Um, starting in 1995, we provided a drop-in every Friday night for LGBTQ <coughs> to help have a safe space that they could go and hang out with other gay kids and just be, have fun. And um, so that's you know almost 20 years later. Now we have 18 different events a month that, that are targeting youth. But it's not just us. We're a, we're the center. We're the partner. We're working with UPMC right now. Serves with Prasad, with KATF, with almost every organization. Uh, you know, Will Pugh came in and did a press, you know, show some movies to the kids one night. But we're, we do a lot of homeless outreach for youth, and uh, we do uh, work on resiliency and mental health skills and different pieces like that, as well as creating social opportunities. We um, have. The phone line still exists. It receives hundreds of calls a month. Lots of people who are closeted feel safer calling the phone than they do sending an email. Um, that's all volunteer. We have uh, programs for service seniors over seniors over adults 50 and over. Seniors. We actually officially call them community elders. So. Um, <laughs> So we uh, they, we had some people looking for something to do. So one of them got a group started. It's called Nexus, and they get together every month, every couple weeks, and just do all kinds of different activities. So the community center has a huge array of programs, and it would take me all day to list them. Um, another thing that we're known for is an outrageous bingo, which is gay bingo. It's not. It's not our program. We're the beneficiary, one of the beneficiaries of it. We do a lot of the volunteering, and a lot of our board members are involved. But come on in. We're just talking about bingo. So is this the social media and the news? No. Uh, no. 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 This, this is bad. This is bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is this? This is the LGBTQ community. Oh, uh, no. sorry. <laughs> we get that reaction a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that actually happens on a regular basis. So, so the GLCC has historically been, um, I guess, information referral was the best kind of way to to describe it. That we're the place you call, and we're going to get you connected with the film festival, connected with a gay friendly physician. We're going to help you find a bowling league. We're gonna, you know, help you find apartments or whatever it is that you need to do. So, um, so it's kind of natural for us to take the lead of seeing what we could be doing with social media. So I'm gonna jump right into here. When I got on board with the GLCC social media in May, June, boy, it was interesting. They, like many small groups, and again, we're talking very small budget. You know, 
were doing the best they can, and it was kind of a scattershot approach based on what most of the interns were interested in. So they had a Twitter account, a Twitter, as they said. They had a Facebook page. They had actually eight Facebook pages. So they had a bunch of groups. <laughs> and, and yeah, so it was, it was, it was well-intentioned, and they were trying. But what they lacked was really an understanding of, of how to use social media to engage people, not as a marketing tool. You know, it was not eight bulletin boards. So you know, when I got on board, we started tightening all that up and, and, and trying to get everything kind of reeled back into it, like a very simple level, and then looking to see what can we do and how can it be sustainable so that when Sue goes away, somebody can step in and keep it running. And um, so, and now we have Twitter, Facebook. We have a very flourishing, thriving one of our when use Facebook group, where um, I mean, it's just probably getting eight or ten new members a day, people who just want to share and have conversations themselves. And um, I've set us up on Instagram and um, uh, Pinterest, but we're not really using it very much right now. It's just more or less reserving the placeholder name. So, um, so how did you guys get started in social media? Well, um, when I joined the board um, three years ago, we had barely anything. We had a Facebook group that nobody really did anything with. Um, so my first thought was, well, let's get a Facebook page so we can actually have this name. Um, and, uh, and so that started picking up really well. But still at that time, I myself wasn't that comfortable with social media. I'm basically all like, I took a webinar and self-taught. Um, so, so once I started to get the hang of things and you know that you have to post, you know, all the time basically to stay, um, stay up on it. And then I created a Twitter, um, which nobody else on the board um, has any access to because they don't care about Twitter, but they're glad that we have it. Um, and uh, we have a Google Plus page that, um, you know, is just there. Um, I post, I try to post as much as I can, but um, Google Plus is still not that popular um, with, uh, with a lot of people, at least not in the, this area. Um, and, uh, and we do have a Pinterest uh, page, um, which is a great way to keep track of, like, films that we like. Um, and then, of course, the, the festival films, we have the entire lineup. Um, and on the boards in there too, so people can see them and go link to other things. And um, we do have one that's um, <coughs> LGBT um, organization, things like that, that will link to um, some of our other um, agencies in the in this in the area. They can go right to their page and find what they're looking for. So that, that's helpful too. There are, are at least two dozen other organizations, just even in the, in the Allegheny County area, and if you look at all of Western Pennsylvania, closer to 50, I would say, because there's a lot of small groups of people that, you know, there's a group called Gay Wexford. Has anybody ever heard of that? They're on Twitter. <coughs> yeah, how they got about them. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do stuff. They, they, they're doing what they're doing. So, um, so, you know, I took some time to look and see what the different organizations were doing, and we had a meeting in July to talk about it and to kind of get a sense of where everyone was and how we could help each other. You know, I knew from my own experience that we could help each other simply by sharing each other's information. <laughs> it seems pretty fundamental. But it was also apparent to me that finding the time to use social media properly was a big barrier for almost every single group. That either due to the lack of volunteer time, the lack of staff time, or both. Um, and the other piece is that no one has a plan. No one has done any social media planning, um, and, and that they're not alone. Most nonprofits do not have a plan. Um, so they haven't gone through that process. They also don't have policies and guidelines, hence, eight Facebook pages. I mean, because there's, you know, and my former employer, I remember very distinctly, there was a rule, never ever create anything on social media. It had to go through the communications department. And that makes sense. It's a good rule. But, you know, of course, when you're a volunteer group, you tend to think, oh, hey, let's set one up just for this group or that group. So, um, so there, you know, there were those issues. You know, but we do have other organizations that are out there. The Pittsburgh Games Task Force, the 
uh, for SAD Center. Um, the arts groups are actually like, like uh, real cute, using it pretty well. Dreams of Hope, which is our youth performance group, and then also our uh, Renaissance City Choirs. So, you know, we started talking, and then I happened to find this research that was conducted, uh, published in June, and it was put out by the Pew, Pew Trust, and it was about uh, just a look at the LGBT community, and they had some data on our online presence, and I thought, well, that's a great place to start with some actual concrete data. And what we saw is that basically our community uses social media more than the regular population, and our community and our youth use Facebook more than the general population. So you know, there's this perception that Facebook is not as trendy with the young people, um, but apparently that's not that's not necessarily the case in the LGBTQ community. And I know that when I look at the demographics on our pages, I see that and we have a lot of teens that are following us, which is fine. The other thing that was very interesting is that um, where is this? Okay. 58% of the adults who responded to the survey are not out online. So they're using these social media sites, but they're not out. So what does that mean? That means they're not going to like our Facebook page because their name is going to be tied to something that says gay and lesbian. And they're, for what I they're not going to comment. They're probably not going to share. They're going to come look at it. So the insights that we get aren't going to be perfect for us. And we always have to remember that there's a group of people who are not out, but still looking for us, looking for what we have to offer them. And I think that's something that's probably very unique to our community, where people don't want to necessarily identify with that label. So uh, something that may appear to not be successful <coughs> you know, in terms of the post, like no one likes it, you know, it, it, we don't know. So as an example of how I respond to that, every single day on a Twitter, I always put our phone number. Call us if you need us, Monday through Saturday, 12 to 9, we're here to talk to you. And every other day I try to put out the Trevor Project's hotline, 800 line for you. And then I do similar things on Facebook, because my thought is for putting it out there, it's kind of like a free ad, you know, to say, I mean, if they call us for something that's concrete, great, but if they're just, you know, looking for someone to call, that's a way we can take advantage of the fact that they're out there, they're just not necessarily connected with us. So, I, you know, I threw that out to the group, and I said, you know, we've got, how do we connect with people? How do we use social media to engage people who choose not to be engaged? That's kind of a, we haven't figured that part out yet. It's only been a couple of months here. I was just going to mention to you that you might want to look at, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but there's an OEA group that's on, on Facebook, and it's like only open to people um, who are out, you know, recovering alcoholics. And it doesn't, like, your posts or anything don't go out to anyone but the people in that group. Or if you share and things like that, so it's very. Anonymous. We we realize that there are tools that we could use. It's just that um, you know we're not in a position right now where we could pursue that. We just have to have it on the, on the, on the list of things to consider mm -hmm. because it's hard enough to have time to just do uh, well, you know tweet and Facebook <laughs> and, and and put it out there. Well, and even even with the closed group, um, there are still people out there who won't join the group yeah, because great. they don't want other people to see them. And yeah. you know, for work purposes, you know, obviously this state is not really uh, you know supportive of us gays. So um, you know, some people don't want that out there, even in a closed group. So, unfortunately, so we brought we brought everyone together, and what we decided to do was to. Uh, just start paying attention to what we were sharing and seeing what could be retweeted or reshared or reposted. For the community center, that's pretty easy because that anything anyone puts out is probably something we could share. For film society, it's a little bit different. You know, they're not going to necessarily um, 
posts about a men's bowling group. And maybe they need some filler, you know. <laughs> or maybe there's On a the movie. Yeah, maybe yeah. 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 that's the so what we we set up a Twitter list, and I think there are 34 different accounts on it right now, and it's um, just it's just groups and organizations. We're not doing businesses right now, and we're not doing personal accounts. Like Thomas and I are both you know queer bloggers, but we're not on there. But I do have some of the media outlets, like the Erie Game News, and just because of course that there's also interesting content there. So we have the Twitter list, and then we have um, a Facebook interest group, which I set up, which is the same kind of thing. Are you familiar with that, where you can uh, subscribe a bunch of accounts to and set it up, and then other people can sign up and look at it. And um, It's not a group like a joining group. It's, it's more of a list, and it just creates a feed. And, uh, so I don't even know how many people are on that. But So we, we decided that that would put everything in one place. People could look at it if they wanted to or not. And Today, rather than me give you a list of everybody on Twitter and everyone on Facebook, what I, what I have done is tweeted out the uh, PDF file with the URLs from those the Twitter list and the Facebook list, and you can take a look to see who you want to follow. So that was a real simple first step, and it just you know, took me about half an hour. And in the ensuing two months, I think we've seen our numbers go up pretty dramatically in terms of how much we're sharing each other's information. Just because it's easy to see, I think a lot of people start using Twitter and they have no idea what the list is. And, you know, so when you show them that, suddenly they're like, "Oh, look, yes, of course I want to share this." It makes their job a lot easier because they don't have to come up with so much original content. And that that's really beneficial for us because we're sort of an event-based organization. We have our festival and then we do quarterly films throughout the year. So there's you know months that go by that there's nothing to like really promote about us so it's really good to have these other organizations that we can say hey did you know about dreams of hope um they're having a concert this day um so it really helps us to just have those fillers as well instead of having you go and find you know a story on a gay film you know from like 1960 or whatever to, to tweet out when i can just say oh i see something that's interesting i'll tweet that out instead so we, um, you know, are basically at this point right now where we're, we're communicating with the Google group set up, where we're facing the same barrier is that people don't have time to put into talking about planning to do social media better so that they can engage people. I mean, it's just this kind of vicious cycle. And unfortunately, what I wanted to happen, what I was afraid would happen did, is everybody put their interns on the list. And mm -hmm. so there's no actual, and I would say deciders, and I'm just certainly not discouraging interns, but that's part of the problem, is that we put these duties on people, and we're not instructing them to create it with sustainability in mind. So, I mean, that's, that's to their detriment as well. But it, you know, so we're, we're definitely working to get folks um, connected, and then we're, you know, and I'm trying to do a lot of cheerleading, because I have time, because I, you know, Put into this. So when I see someone retweet somebody else's something, I shout out, do a lot of thank yous, a lot of hey, you know, you know this. But you know, the action for the gay community is on Facebook. Twitter's great. You know, we had some we were just talking to some of the cool people that have retweeted our stuff, and that's really interesting. But we're on Facebook and it is really popular. Our you're in our our group is yes. just like yes. I mean, if you watch the feed, it's just people post, I need a job, I'm going to hang out, here's this, here's that. It's just constant, you know, people looking for connection. That's what they're craving. And uh, there's dozens of groups, you know, lesbians in Mount Lebanon set up their group, and uh, young people here set up their group. And so, which makes our job a little tough, because now we have to go around to all these groups and put, put our information out there, and, you know. Which, of course, we can't post this on our page, so you have to post it as yourself yeah. and link to your page. Which, so, they just want to make things up. <laughs> so, you know, so it's, 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 you know, it's certainly been really interesting. So there's this whole concept of, you know, outing people that, but that's, that's an issue. There's also um, the fact that we do have a wide age range. You know, on our Facebook page, we have teenagers. We'll take anyone. 13, obviously, hopefully that's as young as they are. 
And I know we have people in their 60s and 70s that are that are as well. So when I'm thinking about content, I'm having to you know constantly balance um, what's going to be interesting, what's going to serve people's needs, and not going to pull them off. Now I, I'll post twice a day, which is a lot for Facebook. Some people, you know, the, I guess the recommendation is twice a week is minimum. But, you know, but it's I can see it being consumed with the likes and the, you know I watch analytics, so I can see that people really respond to that. And what they love. More than anything is when I post profiles of people, volunteers, former board members, simply just the two men in our community, both of them just had something in the paper written about them. I post that, went off the chart. It was just reading about other people, you know, and it was, that's, that's been very helpful. And again, I think that goes back to people want to connect. Um, I think that for a community center that's located in downtown Pittsburgh, and technically serves Western Pennsylvania, these are going to be really important things for us to develop because a lot of people are never going to come to Pittsburgh and come to the actual community center. So finding ways to to keep them hooked in is, uh, is a challenge, but the, you know, the staff and volunteer piece is really hard. So what we're, our next step is we're hoping to start in January is doing the planning process. And since everybody has no plan, <laughs> what we're going to try to do is everybody get together and plan together. And that way you'll have a room full of experts who also have a general understanding of your population and your organization. And we can, um, you know, just come up with, uh, I told them, I said, let's just do a one page policies. You know, policies can be pretty universal. There shouldn't be, I mean, a good non-profit practice that goes into play here, which is what we could pull from. The communications. The, the logo should stay under someone's control. You, know, you should not just have volunteers free to put the logo up anywhere they want on social media. You know, nobody should start an Instagram account not tell anybody. <laughs> you know, um, and you know the, these are the things that we're hoping that by collaborating we can actually uh, educate ourselves and come up with something concrete, protect ourselves in case there's any liability issues, and then also sort of tackling that. That hidden issue. Um, any other barriers that we're facing? I think I mentioned it. Um, I don't. Know, my biggest challenge is, is the time. That's, that's my biggest challenge is fitting it in. Can I ask a more like technically related question? I didn't understand, and I'm just sort of getting into this kind of stuff. Um, when you said. You know, you're trying to connect to other groups or let people know that you're there too. But you said when you go there, you can't put a link to your page. You have to put it to yourself. No, you oh. can't post as your as your page in a group or on another page on, some, oh, on somebody okay. else's profile. profile. Okay. So you have to post as yourself. You can post on your pages. Okay. But you can't can't go on there as the right. I can't I can't post on Sue's personal page gotcha. from Real Q. Gotcha. So, um, but she can post on my page. That's her. Yeah. So I have a question about having the because I have this issue too with you know people will start <coughs> you know, a Facebook page at some point for the group and then someone else starts a page and then someone else has a group somewhere else. And it can be really challenging to try to consolidate. Sometimes you can't get a hold of the admin. And I haven't found yet that Facebook has any sort of thing in place that you can hey, can we figure this out? So well, how did you go about trying to consolidate? Well, I'm still working on that. Okay. <laughs> but Facebook has um, a tool that you can claim your uh, identity, so to speak. So if someone tried to set up a Chevrolet account, you know, Chevrolet can say, no, 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 that's, you know, our, it, it, it's not as tight as a trademark, but, you know, you, you can look in the help section and just clean my page, or, um, you can also consult merge pages, so if you have, that's actually the better choice, because then all their people come along with it. So, you know, what would happen is, remember they used to have places, pages, they, to some extent, do, now you can merge them, uh, so that you're not losing people instantly are following you. Um, I'm having a problem with control because people that run the pages want to be in control because it's their project. 
and they're not used, you know, they're in, in grassroots groups, and you guys are shaking your heads, so I think you know this. The person who runs the group, whatever the, it is, the women's group, the men's group, what, they do everything. They make the flyers, they make the arrangements, they call the florists, you know, and then the person who's doing the other group is doing that, all those same things. That's kind of the whole point of creating a nonprofit is that you start to formalize those roles. And then instead of everyone doing their own communications work, you have someone to do that. But when you make that change, that transition, it's tremendously stressful. You lose people. Because why should I let Mary design my flyers? I've been designing my flyers for 50 years. You know, and the same thing is true with social media, is that people have a lot of sense of ownership. The other piece is they don't really know how to use it very well. I have um, one organization we're trying to work with who the communications person doesn't have Facebook or Twitter. And I have absolutely no idea how it works. And so an assistant does. And I you know, said, I was like, I just don't think that's very good. I think, you know, it's kind of like, you know, wouldn't you just once in a while look at the commercials on TV or check the ads out in the newspaper or something just to kind of eyeball them? And, you know, even if it was not a trust issue, but just so you kind of knew what you were doing. And you could sound like you knew what you were doing. But there was like, no, I don't have time for that. That's like a, they look at it as a game, kind of like doing a farm bill or something. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so, uh, so, yes. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting that you know literally you have like uh, 35, 36 people and everybody's in a completely different place. We have to try to get into you know some problems. Wow. How did that person not notice that Facebook's IPO was like a billion dollars? Like that was in the news. Where do they think that money is coming from? I think to be honest with you, they're so overworked. So busy, and so yeah, seriously. That I think it's just like, I mean, we're talking about organizations that are like existing on nothing. Their budgets have all been cut. They're laying people off. So I do think a lot of it is just yeah. Like I bet if you if you explain that, they would be like, oh yeah, of course. But right. But in terms of just it being a priority, he's more concerned about the staff that they just had laid off, and like you know thinking about that, and you know. Or the funding cuts. I bet you can imagine that the gay groups got funding cuts. <laughs> the poor bits of industry. Right. <laughs> well, you know, so you're right. So there's yeah. there's a there's a lot of education that needs to happen with the people doing it who are deciding, making decisions, and then also um, organizationally, institutionally, helping them understand what's a good fit. I mean, my Lindsay from the JLCC, she said, "Oh, the Tumblr. Let's start the Tumblr." I'm like, it's not like a dance. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like the kids are talking about the Tumblr. I'm like, we're not doing the Tumblr. We have enough trouble with our WordPress blog, you know. But I went reserve the name, so it's, it's there when we're ready to do the Tumblr. And I was like, the kids can just look at the blog. I mean, we just don't have the time or energy to. The kids do love the Tumblr. They now. do. Yeah, you know what the kids, the kids thing now? The kids do. Oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you my mother's <laughs> We um, Actually, that is an interesting uh, segue. We are talking a lot about how to tap into the youth and their use of social media. And uh, part of it, again, is a lack of resources because you know, we only have one computer at the center. Uh, most of our kids do not have smartphones because most of them are. Um, and low income families or homeless. So, you know, they're using uh, social media at the library. Yes. So they know Facebook. I think that's why that works better than Twitter. But, um, you know, we'd love to get them more invested. But you have to think, too, is that we're working with kids that have extra vulnerability, extra vulnerability and susceptibility and maybe not have the same level of judgment because of the lack of home support. So that's one of those things where it's going to require intense investment, like, you know, like probably a, a part-time dedicated staff person or a miracle person. And um, but we, you know, we, we definitely would like to do it. And they want to, they want me to come in and do a social media presentation, which I'm just like, oh gosh, the 15 year olds in social media, that could be very interesting. But I think, you know, that the other group that is using social media are, are older adults. You see that, you know, everyone's joking about Facebook, the grandma on Facebook. Well, there's a lot of grandma age lesbians and lesbians who are grandmas, you know. So, I mean, that they're there too, and, and they're 
networking, and I mean, they've got some all kinds of groups set up, and um, they are, that's my go-to group to give me a lot of likes when I post a volunteer profile. Oh, they're like, oh, he's so sweet. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's great. But, but the thing is, though, is that we're facing this issue of aging. And, and you know, we're going to have the first, the first real decade of post-baby boomer senior citizens. Right now, there are over there are 3 million LGBT seniors 65 and over. And they expect that within five years, that's going to triple. And they have unique needs. We have unique needs. It's okay, Laura. I'll still be with you. <laughs> um, we, you know, that we have, but are they still going to be using social media? Yeah. Well, you know, it's an interesting fact, though, because a lot of them are going to be poor. So they may use social media at the library or the senior center. And then is our phone line going to need to be more aggressive? Like, I kind of think I'm going to hit this, this piece with this class divide in our society, and like, all of you who work with on profits probably see this. Is that the phone is more and more important than ever? Like someone answering your phone to, to give people information, and I think that within another ten years, it's not going to flip at all. I think it's just going to grow. And it'll be the phone is back to where it was, but people will still be using the internet. And you know, how do we deliver services to them? I mean, is there at some point will the film festival do some online? I mean. You know, I use this. Well, it, it worries me because of all the, you know, the video on demand and things like that, where things are becoming available while they're still in the theaters, and are people going to still go to the theater and spend, you know, nine dollars when they can spend three ninety nine to rent it and the privacy of their own home? Like that kind of stuff worries me. I don't think it worries the other board members because there's, you know, they're still thinking like, oh, everyone likes to go to the theater. Um, <laughs> And uh, and I'm like, well, think about it. Like this is this may be something that's going to happen. You know, I'm you know, I, the festival. It, it's not just necessarily about going to the theater and seeing the film. It's about the experience of being able to see a film that you wouldn't see in Pittsburgh if we didn't bring it here. So you know, that's sort of what it's about. And um, you know, we will always have the the, the lifers who come every year, but the, I think the younger generation is just going to be like, well, I can watch it at home. And now they have TVs that are like the size of a wall, so you don't even need to go to a theater to see it on the big screen, you know? So that kind of stuff worries me. <laughs> they just slow down. So we're, you know, we're at a point as a collaborative that we've, we've met, we've had a chance to identify you know, what can we do right away to kind of build some cohesion? And that has worked. We, you know, like just this today was a great, and Jamie and I didn't really know each other before we had that meeting, and you know, um, now we're principal friends, and you know, we're doing all this. But you know, we were able to put this together pretty pretty fluidly. You know, we're talking about barriers. We're talking about looking at a grant, fund, you know, funded opportunity to do that planning. And we're, you know, looking at some real solutions that are realistic. You know, it is realistic for us to get a plan and a policy designed. You know, again, and like I said, simple is fine. That is something I think the funder is going to look at and say that's a good first step. And then all of these organizations can you know, draw on each other's institutional knowledge. And maybe part of your policy is that the communications director has to have a Facebook account. And they don't have to do anything with it. Like they could have their own account and, you know, just maybe friend. No, but just be able to go get on and look at stuff and do stuff. That makes good sense. Maybe some groups don't think that's necessary. I don't know. Maybe in some organizations, you think you shouldn't use your own account. You should only use the group's account. Now, this is a, a big thing for me is when people don't follow the rules on Facebook. When people set up personal profiles to represent businesses or organizations, and I'll say, and I tell them that all the time, it's not just that it annoys me, which Laura will tell you just because I'm. <sighs> You know, but it's also the idea that they're going to put all this time and energy into it, and then someday Facebook will just take it all away. You know, and they're going to get friends, and like, and I feel like that's kind of a waste of your time because it's not like you can back it up or anything. And that, you know, and, and I see that happening because that's how they get around that idea of not being able to post because they set up their own, uh, their own profile. And I have to, this is, you know, me as a personal thing, I have to bite my tongue because there are some of our folks are doing that. And I'm like, okay, it's their choice. You know, make sure we discuss the risks they're taking, and then you know, see what happens from from that point forward. But um, I don't like it personally because I don't like when someone cheats so they can post on my Facebook page. 
And it's not just because it's like the principle of it, it's because I feel like I'm being invaded by a marketing, marketing attempt. You know, even if it's a nonprofit or a good cause, I'm just like, no, 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 no. You still have to play, you know, like this is still supposed to have some privacy here. And so that's just my personal thing. But, you know, I think that's something when we have a policy discussion that we would talk about. I just want to comment, sorry, I'm just on, you know, with pages now having those insights. It's almost like a good selling point to get them away from the personal because you have no idea really what's happening on your personal account. And I have a situation with nonprofit that. They're using a personal account, and then we have an issue where we want to set up an event through the page, and then they set up an event, and now we have two events. Who yeah. wants the wait? I already said I was going to this, so yeah. And it also, kind of, it also just looks super unprofessional. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. it's, it's organized. organized. Yes. It looks like and it's yeah. just one thing, like two different yeah. events, and just not for people to enter. And then people get confused when they check out because guess what? There are twenty other things competing for their attention at the exact same time. So that's really. Uh, I think that's an excellent point, and it's a good selling point, especially with the um, the funded and staff organizations that are going after. Uh, this image is very important. To um, what we you know really need to move to for these groups is that their communications person probably you know has to be in charge of social media communication and and coordinating that for development team and all that sort of stuff. But it's going to look different for every group. That's why I think, you know, we're just going to have to see what happens. The GLCC doesn't have anyone. We don't have a communications person. I do it all, even though I'm just supposed to do social media. And it's just my default because there's nobody. I'm like, where's the press release? I, I'll write the press release. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very complicated. And then you have the extra layer of the LGBTQ community elements. Um, you know, it's not fun. I'm going to tell you this, and I, you know, and I feel a little emotional about this. On Thursday, reading a county commissioner in Western Pennsylvania, I mean, Eastern Pennsylvania, saying that my relationship is like pets, that we're, domestic partners are like pets. And then the next day, hearing the governor say that our, our desire to get married is like incest. Uh, are you all familiar with that yeah. happening yesterday? Of course you are, because boy, that went all over the media. It hurts to have to be exposed to it all day, and people tune out. That's why they go hang out in the like private groups and talk about pictures of, you know, pink and hotties and all this kind of thing. like, because it's it's so overwhelming. To be, I saw Corbett's face like I can't even count how many times on my Facebook feed in the last two days, and I I'm like, can you post the story and just not post this picture? Because I just want to punch the screen. I can't. So yeah, and sorry if anybody's a fan of kids, but I doubt. I hope you're in here. here. <laughs> I hope you would agree you shouldn't have said that. But the, the the big thing is, is Pennsylvania is the battleground state politically for the next four or five years while that that ACLU case works its way out. And it's only October, and I am so exhausted. I don't, I'm a blogger, so you know that adds to that, you know. But it's just that you know every single day. There's something. Someone's getting married. Someone's not getting married. Someone's working license. You know, it's just constant, and I'm just like, you know, it takes an emotional toll on you to be at the battleground. Much less, you know, this is me being honest with you personally. My partner and I were not married. Trying for us to try to sort out what this all means for us legally and financially is very overwhelming, and, and we're both. I mean, we're a lawyer. I'm a social worker. You know, we have like. All these advantages. It's overwhelming as can be. And now the government shut down, so we can't even call anybody. <laughs> and, and I mean, all of those things happening are like stressors that, like, what? Nobody would have thought of that a year and a half ago. So when we started doing, like, when I had to cover the corporate thing for Facebook, I, I, I put out a statement from the GLCC, and I had to come up with this message of, like, hang in there. We're here for you. Call us if you need us. And then I was like, God, I hope the people working the front line know what the hell's happening because you know, <laughs> like you know, I just I don't know if anyone called or not, but it's like we need to like be on top of that too because it's not just like some distant thing that happened that's tragic. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. We're good, and the truth is, something tragic's going to happen in Pennsylvania at some point. And it's just these things are you know. That's why I think it's important that we're we're showing solidarity and we're you know getting together and we're all going to say, hey. It's a really hard month. Let's all go to the movies. Yes. October eleventh. 
Yeah. 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 No one's afraid of the skin. Is that the one that Chloe's big news in? What? Uh, the giant book? Yes, she's uh, it, she, it's a small part, but yeah, she's in it. Mm-hmm. Um, just on that last point, uh, if I can just chime in. Like, I uh, I'm subscribed to newsletters for Abaz and Amnesty International, which I love because if they're great news aggregators, right? So I don't have to watch CNN; I can just get the news in a way that makes sense to me. That's you know. But one of the great things that both of them do is they both also send out periodic kind of um, digests of all the amazing campaigns they won. So they'll say like, hey guys, you know, Save the Bees was really awesome. Here's how many people signed it. Here's what happened. Here's something, you know, we saved this 15 year old girl who's accused of adultery of, you know, getting 200 lashes. Awesome. We did it as a community. And so when I read those, like I think it's at the end of the week or something, I'm like, wow, it reinforces my connection to the community because I see the impact that it's having. So if you just donate and then you don't see anything back, it's hard to emotionally and psychologically right identify. Um, so I really think that that thing that you're talking about is a really serious issue. Yeah. Thank you. And actually, you know, we didn't even get into donations. Yeah. Online stuff. Oh, yeah. At, at, but it's an important thing because <laughs> the GLCC is going to start a membership draft. We're just going to do a very low key, no big fan. Melissa's actually recording it. She left now. But but we're talking about that, about how to do it online because we don't even have PayPal. I mean, you know, so we have like, we're like trying to catch up. And, um, you know, and our goal is not to, is to engage people and to do what you said. You know, someone told me that they belong to that group Water which I guess works on access to clean water around the world. And they called him on his birthday. Like they have a staff person who called him. I said, happy birthday, we hope you have a great day. How are things going? And never said a single word about a donation or anything else. And he actually posted it on Facebook, admitted that it made him cry, and then donated. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, and now that's stuck with me. Yes. And now I'm just like, I'm gonna, you know, that's exactly yeah, kind of right. what you're saying is that you want to. That's interesting. That's, I haven't heard of that before, but that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's an investment of resources, right? But yeah. it's also super added value on the perspective of the member or the consumer, right? So, right. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that um, there's a lot we can do. You know, we're, we're looking at how we can use video, put more stuff on YouTube talk about our youth, what we're doing, um, and you know, finding interesting ways to tell our story, but we're also trying to keep the doors open and the lights on. And not if all of you are like, yes, I know that struggle, but you know, that's that's a real challenge for us because um, we used to have tenants. This is an interesting thing about our relationship. We used to have tenants. I feel bad. And, but you should not. <laughs> but people moved away from brick and mortar space. So, you know, we're finding a new thing to do with this. So, when Real Q left, I was talking with the director, Mitch. Is, that, is he the chair? Director, I don't know. He's a president. Whatever. He's a president. No, we I was telling them how we don't have enough movies for the youth to watch. But they've seen everything we have in a zillion times. And it just became this natural fit. Well, let's ask people to bring old movies to the film festival. Like, that's a, a super human, just easy thing. And he's like, whoops, well, every single time we have a movie from now on. Because, and then people get a dollar off or a free popcorn or something. And then, you know, plus they can get rid of their old movies. Because if you, if you find, oh, I can give them the community center, great, you know. And, and well, I don't know, have we got anything? We did. I have them in my house. I think that we. We, we didn't get many, and I actually supplied some of them. But, um, but I'm hoping that, and I, I was, when I when we get close to the festival, I'll obviously tweet it out and, and post it about people bringing a film, and they'll, they're going to be entered into a drawing to win a prize at the end. So, um, yeah, if you guys have any DVDs you don't want anymore. They don't have to be LGBT films. They can be anything. Kid, little kids, little kids. But the thing is, is that that's a new partnership. So now they're not renting from us. But now all of a sudden, so just before the last week, we got a ton of PO cross promotional mentions. And, you know, and there's this tie now, this like ongoing affinity that I think will more than offset financial needs. Because now we know that they're always going to promote us and help our kids. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's a really big thing. And um, and that's something that they can do. I mean, they're not losing anything. They already have volunteers there. So putting that box in the movie, I mean, it's a little bit more effort, but it's not like we're asking them to do something, you know, like 
it's not like a coffee house saying, hey, collect something for us. So it's, it's been very interesting to see, and using social media is a great way to remind people rather than the video. <laughs> Don't forget your DVD. Um, you know, we've even told people if you want to give us like Netflix subscriptions or whatever. I mean, like, you know, we can be really creative with it. So, so um, it's good old fashioned cross promotional efforts and working together, but also, you know, having a little bit of a social media twist. I think. Does anybody have any burning questions? Non burning questions? Do you feel like, do you have any questions about the LGBT community in general? Or, you know? Yeah, sure. I'll say one more thing and then I'll shut up. Um, I am just like digging this entire presentation because I feel like what we're actually talking about is um, clearing actually how we think about social media. And I'm sure there's some queer scholar out there who's already like working on this and writing a dissertation on it. But it just when you find that person, you let well, them know. Yeah, and then they can generate great content for you to share. Yeah, like, including exactly. your original research with like goals. Um, because I think that when we think about collaboration, a lot of us are like, oh, we collaborate. Like, it's some kind of luxury. Mm -hmm. But what you guys are talking about is you're saying, like, no, we have to collaborate. Yeah. We're not doing this because it's innovative, and this, it's trending, and because it's the new and hip thing. We're doing it because we actually just don't have a choice, and because we won't be able to get done what we need to get done otherwise. Absolutely. And it's the same thing where you're like, yeah, how do you reach out to people who are invisible or semi visible? And are not going to identify with your brand because so much of the language that we use about brand identification, I just realized is heteronormative. And so that's why it's like my whole mind is like blowing. And I consider myself to be sort of somewhat educated, sort of somewhat aware, or I try to be aware kind of person. And yet I use this language too because that is the language that we've inherited as marketers and branders, right? And yet there are so many ways in which that is really very narrow and one sided. So thank you, anyways, for that. Well, thank you for bringing that up because you know that's. Well, yes, thank you for the comment, but also it's just it's it's one of those other interesting pieces is you know doing a discussion around branding is so far unfundable that it's just you know it's you know we need to because the funders don't consider that something you know, that they want to do, but I think. It would be very interesting to come from an academic point of view or a research driven point of view using like the GLCC as an example. As a case study. Yeah, but yeah. that's yeah. that's something that we could probably look at. Um, so I'll call you and uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> clean me up. <laughs> I'm actually not a queer scholar, but I have an interest in it and I'm, I'm interested in women's studies also. So, anyways. Well, we, we, we love our allies, at least in our community. <laughs> I do think there's a very distinct there's an important distinction between our community and allies, but then I know that allies are not the same as the general population. Like there's a lot of layers there, and uh, you know, I really appreciate that because we're LGBTQIA. <laughs> so who who can? It's LGBTQIA. What does that all stand for, Laura? You can't answer it. She doesn't ever remember anyway. Oh, come on, we, we at least know the first one, couple ones, right? Lesbian, gay, mm -hmm. trans, bisexual, mm -hmm. queer. So just Q and Q. Q, Q. Q. Queer questioning. Yes. Two A's. What are they? Ally and asexual. And then I. Intersex. Intersex. What is it's um I hate to use this word, but um, people are born hermaphrodite, it's now the term intersex. Oh, but they're born with both both, yes. Yes. both, both and then there's also now the the their G is being added on for gender queer. And um <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to make the Twitter post <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, 140 characters is just gonna be every letter. <laughs> I've got some keychains here if anybody wants. These are the ones that have the, the flashlight. Ooh, yeah, no. I, I have a good question. When you talk about, or sorry, talk about collaboration and people not knowing what they're doing, and I'm in kind of a situation right now with my organization. Um, I 
I like I don't want to be like bragging. I'm like I know what I'm, I'm I like to think I know what I'm doing, and the person who's in charge of social media does not. So 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 how do you how did you approach that? How do you start having this conversation? Yeah, I put a lot of the labels on people. I think the kids are just like the kids. You know, I say that. Yeah. Like, it's, 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 they've embraced. They've taken that word back. A lot like the a lot of lesbian community has taken the word back. Like, you know, the we bike marches and you know. But it is one of those things like I wouldn't suggest that you call someone queer you know, <laughs> unless you knew that they personally preferred that. But if yeah. you were friends your friend Mary said I want to be identified as queer and you respected that and used that word. That's it's one of those words where it's part of our evolving sense of yeah. Uh, good question. Perfectly valid, and you know, the word that, that, that I personally don't like is homosexual. <laughs> really? Yeah. Which is the first letter of the one. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so. How, how do you identify in that case? Um, I find whatever the first. I is. but I, I call myself a lesbian or gay or okay. whatever. But you don't. So you're okay with gay or lesbian, but not homosexual. Homosexual just sounds like it's. I don't know. Well, like, yeah, it's, it's actually not an It's not accurate because it's it's a medical definition related to uh, sexual sexual behavior, mm -hmm. and it really just describes men. And mm -hmm. it, uh, on the thing I tweeted at, which hopefully I have, I've talked about our Twitter accounts, GLCC PGH, um, I have a link to the Glad Media Guide, which has a really nice synopsis. I was, yeah, I was talking with somebody about the GLAD, the, the one of the GLAD, I guess, like, definite, like, list of definitions, and how there is also a problem between how people talk on the West Coast and how people talk on the East Coast. Uh, so there's also a geogra an American specific ge geographical division as well. So it's interesting to bring that up. Yeah, I, what I talk, tell people is, you know, I don't think GLAD is perfect, but I, you know, yeah. I work with them a lot, and I always say, to the media that I talk with, I'm like, if you at least use what Glad has, and you say you wrote it because that's what Glad suggested, in my opinion, that's fine. Yeah, that's not the same thing as my best friend's brother is gay, and he told me it would be okay. Yeah. Like yeah. two completely different things. Now, obviously, if you want the American Family Association's guide to the media, <laughs> that would not be good for the media. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I think that's between, uh, like yeah. also tweet. <laughs> and that's right, Louis. Um, tweet, tweet, no. um, super feminine, super feminine, okay, well, well, super feminine lesbian or super feminine yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my brother like, loves to be a tweet. That's him. Yeah. But if I call him out, they might be so like, offended. So like flamboyant, like extremely flamboyant, like Jack from Moonlight. Yeah. And he's okay, except, well, yeah, he's older, but maybe back when There's hipster. usually a lot. Of, yeah, they're younger than hipster okay. age. Does anybody, I don't know if anybody here watched Happy Endings, the show Happy Endings, no. The only one is probably why it got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, but maybe that's also generational. Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah. It's, it's more your. Well, yeah, it's a twig bear. Twig bear. Slim bear. bear. It's actually an old term. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was all age. Like you fit into being a certain kind of gay person. Yeah. Same with women, you know. Yeah. But these are all words that you know. Like, um, chapstick lesbian. I wanted to be honest. You guys, and I'm sure you've come against a lot of anti gay people. Yeah. 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 You have any suggestions for? I'm I'm on Facebook and I'm friends with some other young people, and I found out some of these especially guys are like 